Unleavened Bread Ministries presents From your hands, your feet, your side Unleavened Bread Jesus Bible Studies with David Eels Can quench my thirsting soul Pure as water made me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Greetings, saints. Many blessings to you. Thank you for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Father, we ask your blessings today for wisdom, discernment, and uh, that we retain the things that you tell us, Lord. So many times we get in the thick of battle and we forget the things we've been taught, and that shouldn't be. We ask that your Holy Spirit bring to remembrance all things that you have said unto us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to talk to you today about a harvest that's coming. Uh, really good news. We're calling this the harvest of baby Jesus' body. <laughs> we'll explain it as we go along. Um, the revelation was given to Gano Moser, and I've given some interpretation to it, which I think is exciting. Um, she got this on the 18th of this eighth month of 2019. And it's interesting, you know, she said, as I was in the garden gathering produce this evening, the Lord reminded me of a dream that I had this morning about a baby boy. And, uh, you know, um, as I learned what was going on in this revelation, I saw that the gathering produce from God's garden is what this parable of the baby boy fruit is about. Uh, Song of Solomon 6 and 2 says, My beloved is gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. And then 6.11 says, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the green plants of the valley, to see whether the vine buttered and the pomegranates were in flower. So we got the man-child and the bride um, inspecting the garden. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Gaino said, I was in a home. I don't know whose home it was or if it was even my own. Well, like I said, knowing a little bit more of the revelation, I believe it is the bride's spiritual home. As a type of today's corporate man-child Jesus, the man-child, raised up the bride to take care of his garden. John, uh, seeing the first disciples of Jesus walking with him, uh said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. So Jesus and those first fruits disciples was the bride and the bridegroom. Uh, I know the bride has to come into a certain amount of maturity um, before the rest of the body, and that's why Jesus raised them up to go and preach to the body and raise up the fivefold ministry and so on and so forth. Um, so Gaino said, I was walking rather quickly through the living room. Remember that it's a living room. As I was about to walk past the recliner, I saw a small baby boy, two to three months old. Okay. I believe that this is the spiritual age of an incoming harvest of God's garden who have the maturity of the baby Jesus, not the mature Jesus. Um, we all have a measure of Jesus living in our lives, kind of the living room, right? And the outer man is the spiritual mother of the baby Jesus within. 
Matthew 12 and 50 says, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. And how are we the mother of Jesus? Because he is growing in our spiritual room, spiritual womb, as in the revelation of the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. He sowed the seed in their heart, right? And it was the word or sperma of God, right? And Colossians 1 and 27 says, To whom God was pleased to make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is glowing, is growing in you from glory to glory. As we behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord, which is the gospel that it's already done, it's already accomplished, uh, so as we're seeing Christ in the mirror, we grow from glory to, into his image, from glory to glory, as from the Lord the Spirit. So when this baby Jesus is born is when it begins to be manifested to the world outside, right? Uh, <clears throat> it's growing in the womb of many. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's growing in the womb of many, but it's when it's seen by the people on the outside is, of course, when it's birthed, when it's manifested. And, and Mary, as a type of us bearing the fruit of Jesus, the word, was told, Luke one forty five, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a fulfillment of the things which have been spoken to her from the Lord. So what was spoken to Mary and to us, you know, that we would bear the fruit of Jesus? This is God's promise. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery <laughs> among a lot of the church. They don't understand that, the, that we are to come into the image of Jesus Christ that he is to be manifested in our, quote, mortal body, Paul said, mortal body. And uh, they think, oh, the only way we get this is when we go to heaven. You better not wait, because this is where we bear the fruit. The fruit is on the plant, and the plant is on the earth. And when the fruit is born, that's when the Lord comes and picks the fruit. He picks it, it's already ripened, and he picks it. You see, they're lying to us, and they're causing destruction to many people who are not bearing fruit because they don't think they have to. So Gaino went on to say, I saw the baby nearly fall off the footrest of the recliner. Notice the word rest there. And I believe this is representing the fruit of the man-child Jesus in a new harvest of immature Christians coming to the living room, quote-unquote, of the bride to be raised up. And uh, the problem is that they're in danger of falling from the rest in the troubles to come. And these troubles are coming now. We've been sharing with you how that the deep state is forming an army of antichrists and anarchists and invaders to persecute the church and especially the apostate leadership, their houses and their houses of worship. So the Lord showed us that this is to prepare the church to come out of Babylonish religion and follow the man-child reformers into the wilderness tribulation, as Revelation 12 says. So there are, there are a lot of people who are in bondage and they don't know it. They're in bondage to something that does not believe the gospel and is apostate 
and they these people have been taken into captivity to ba- Babylonish religion because of sin. They're not believing nor heeding the word of God. So Gainol said, I caught the baby before he hit the floor. Praise God. See, that's the job of the bride right there, right? Our prayers and teachings will uphold them. Uh, We have to get the word out so people know the opportunity out there to come into the image of Christ and be strong in the days to come. She said, this little baby had the prettiest blue eyes. And I believe that this speaks of the heavenly discernment of Christ growing in them. And a bright smile as I cuddled him. And I think this speaks of the great joy to be finally getting their eyes open to the truth and coming out of the Babylonish mother. You know, many of you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) When your eyes were opened, you were just full of joy. And there's so many whose eyes have not yet been opened. So pray for them. Uh, Gaynol said, my thought was to find a diaper for him as he was totally naked. Well, yeah, they're needing the word to be dressed up with the works of Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You're putting on the works of Christ, not the works of the world. You're putting off the works of the world. That's the lust of the flesh. And you're putting on the works of Christ. As you see and read and obey the word. People don't think they have to obey. (laughs) What kind of child is that? That doesn't have to obey the parent. That's a rebellious child, right? One that gets spankings. That's what Babylonish captivity is for. It's a spanking for those that rebelled against the word of the Lord, right? Enol said, I just had the thought about finding a diaper and uh, and he peed on me. Well, (laughs) young Christians do do that sometimes. And you have to be ready to put up with it, just like a mama and a baby, right? I I decided he was just excited and happy for me to to cuddle him. Well, no problem. (laughs) They will need love and nurturing um, from Gaynold who is a type of the bride here, led by the man-child. And without this, many will fall away. That's the problem. They are trying to fall away from the rest. And uh, Gaino caught the baby. Praise God. So the Lord wants us to be careful to give answer to a lot of people that are going to be in turmoil because their system is being conquered. Everything that they put their faith in and their belief in is now being conquered and torn down. And they thought this was God's kingdom that wouldn't wouldn't be prevailed against by the gates of hell. Well, that, that's true. The kingdom will not be prevailed against by the gates of hell. But the fact that the gates of hell are taking down their kingdom should let them know something. But they're in confusion, so they need some help, right? The baby and I were the only ones in the dream. There was no one in the recliner, so I don't know how the baby got on the foot rest, there it is, of the chair. Well, they are birthed by God out of Babylon's destruction in heaven's word, right? And it's by heaven's word, right? So, I asked for a verse for this dream by faith at random. And uh, the the text that she got speaks in the text, not just what part she used, but in the text of the people of God coming out of Babylonian religion and, um, and beast captivity because their Babylonian land had been destroyed and Cyrus had freed them to go to Zion, the bride. And there they are the blocks of the building of the restored kingdom of God. So keep that in mind as we read this. She said, I was given, Isaiah 43, 
of seven. My finger was on the word formed. Since this sentence begins in verse five, I'm giving it the context of five through seven. So Isaiah 43, five, fear not, for I am with thee. The confusion that God's people are in are wondering if God is with them when their kingdom gets destroyed by the anarchists and people burning down their buildings and on and on. They are in confusion. Some people fall away from God, but they shouldn't. They should fall away from the dead religion God is judging. Right? But some do fall away from God. And that's why the baby needed to be caught. <laughs> Captured. <laughs> Fear not, I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Every one that is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, yea, whom I have made. Well, this is speaking of Israel as a type of a church coming out of conquered Babylon to go to their man-child-slash-bride reformer leadership in Zion. Okay? <clears throat> and they're being gathered from all over the world to Zion. Notice that Z Zion in the New Testament is a worldwide body, and so is the church, which he's talking to right here, is a worldwide body. But the church has been captive to these Babylonish leaders. And how are they going to follow the man-child into the wilderness if they don't know who he is or if they have respect to those leaders? Okay. So, um, uh, a parallel text to this, Isaiah 49. I'll read it to you. I'm going to read through... Uh, Twenty-six. Okay. I'll go from 12 through 26. Lo, these shall come from far. In other words, they're coming from their captivity, the nation of captivity, right? And lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinim. Notice that the comparison here is, is very, very close to what uh, Gaino got. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, are happy to be free. And break forth into singing, O mountains. In other words, they're leaving their captivity to go back to the mountains of Israel, right? For the Lord hath comforted his people, after their spanking, and will have compassion upon his afflicted. Why are they afflicted? They they. They rebelled against the word of God. They go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies, the Bible says. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and the Lord hath forgotten me. Well, because Zion has been forsaken of the people. The people left the land of Zion and went into captivity. And, and, of course, they felt the Lord had forsaken them. No, the people had forsaken them and went into captivity, and the Lord was chastening them. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, these may forget, but, but I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. That's Zion's walls, which represents the bride, in whom they, uh, these people are fleeing in order to come under the bride, as they were in old times. It's a restoration of the kingdom. I, thy, that is Zion's, children make haste. Thy destroyers and they that made thee waste, that is the Babylon factions that made them waste, right, shall go forth from thee. 
In other words, they're going to be set free. And that, of course, is what Cyrus did. He set God's people free from the factions in Babylon, right? Lift up thine eyes, that is Zion, the bride, round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. So where did the baby come from? <laughs> it ended up in the bride's home, in her living room, on the rest. <laughs> yeah. As I live, says the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament and gird thyself with them like a bride. Looking forward to this, saints, God's people are going to be delivered of their bondage and go to, go to rebuild the kingdom, the real kingdom, not in Babylon. It, we can't serve God in Egypt, Moses said to Pharaoh, right? can't build the kingdom in Egypt. You can't build it in Babylon. It's got to be on the land of promise where they put their feet on the promises, right? <laughs> for as for thy waste and thy desolate places and thy land, what, what got waste and desolate here? Uh, he went, went on to say, that hath been destroyed. It's Babylon. It's the U.S. that's going to come into some a measure of destruction uh, in order for them to come out from among them and be separate. Surely now thou shalt be too straight for the inhabitants. And they, that is Babylon, United States factions of state and church, that swallowed thee up, shall be far away. Okay, he's delivering them out of the factions of church and state and taking them back to their land where they're supposed to be living. Nobody even knows what the New Testament's supposed to be like or what the church is supposed to look like. And you have to read the New Testament to find that out. But they've totally changed it. So, verse 20. The children of thy, that is Zion's, bereavement. She was bereaved of her children when they went into captivity. Right? The children of Zion's bereavement shall yet say in thine ears, the place is too straight for me. That children are saying, oh, this is tough. We got to get out of here. We got to get out of Babylon. Let's go back home. <laughs> Give place to me, that is in the promised land, you, you notice, right? Yeah, they want to go, hey, make room for us, right? In the promised land, that I may dwell. Then shalt thou, that is Zion, say in thy heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have been bereaved of my children? In other words, what is Zion saying? These don't look like the same people that left here. <laughs> notice the children who come back from Babylonish captivity will be different in nature from when they went there that's what the nature of chastening is all about right that's what he's talking about and am solitary Zion is solitary where's all her children well they're coming back but wh wh where do these people come from <laughs> uh Am solitary, an exile, wandering to and fro. And who hath brought up these? Who brought up these? Well, you know, chastening in Babylon brought a measure of repentance among those people. And this destruction said, well, what are we doing here? Let's get out of here. Cyrus set us, Cyrus set us free. Trump set us free. We're going back to our promised land. Mm -hmm. Behold, I was left alone. These, where were they? They were in Babylonish judgment for their sins. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my ensign to the peoples, and they shall bring thy, that is Zion's, sons in their bosom, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Oh, glory to God, folks. These are people who belong under the tutelage of Zion, the bride who is now under the tutelage of the man-child. 
Wow. It's such a good, good promise here. And kings, you know, like Cyrus, Trump, and those that are like him, shall be thy nursing fathers. You know, they're changing up the system and they're plundering the system and they're going to enrich the people who are building the kingdom. You watch and see. And their queens, thy nursing mothers, they shall bow down to thee with their faces to the earth. I saw him in the midst of a bunch of preachers with his head bound towards the ground. And they were praying over him. I hope he gets delivered from that bunch, though. Uh, and lick the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And they that wait for me shall not be put to shame. Amen. Shall the prey, that is the church, Israel, a type of the church, be taken from the mighty, that's Babylon, United States, or the lawful captives? Why are they lawful captives? They were in bondage for their sin. Okay. Be delivered? The answer is yes. <laughs> Delivered from Babylonish leadership and captivity, right? But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Oh, praise God. Have you been worried about your relatives who are still in Babylonish religious captivity, and you've been set free so you know what it is, and you want to tell them, but they won't listen? <laughs> uh, well, God's got a cure coming. Praise be to God. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee. Father will bring the deep state judgment against this U.S. Babylon. But then he will bring them to their Red Sea. All right. He's going to contend with them all right. Remember that. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. And I will save thy children. You got any children out there that have gone goofy? Maybe even gone back to Babylon or they're gone back into the world because they didn't see anything in the church. And now you've graduated a little bit and you want to tell them, hey, there's something better, something better. Oh, yeah, we've been there. They don't want to believe you, right? So what was, what's it going to take for them to be set free? That's what's coming. I will save thy children. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. Yep, they're going to gobble up one another. God's going to uh, set faction in the midst of the factious, and they're going to gobble up one another. And they shall be drunken with their own blood. Oh, my goodness. The factious Edomites in the church and state will be devastated. As with sweet wine, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Well, let me tell you, already the world is looking on and seeing, wow, what could turn a nation's government around this fast uh, nobody's ever been able to do this before and don't give trump the credit either i mean this is from higher up folks you know we got to get i hope you'll start giving credit to the higher up right um so think about that trump's going to bring them to their red sea experience so let's go back into gay knolls text which says the same thing isaiah 43 and we find out what happens to those factious edomites in the church and state who persecuted and killed father's people mm -hmm. isaiah 43 14 through 21 thus saith the lord your redeemer the holy one of israel for your sake i sent to babylon he sent them to Babylon for their sake. See, it's, it's as a chastening for sin so that they may repent, right? 
right? And I will bring down all of them, at, that is the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. I will bring down all of them as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, in the ships of their rejoicing. Yeah, they're so happy that they're able to conquer God's people. But the problem is the system that God's people is in is so totally false and wicked. And it's keeping people from growing up in God. They don't know there's an opportunity for Christ to live in them 30, 60, and 100 fold. They don't know that the fruit that he sowed, the seed of the word in them, which can't bring forth anybody but Jesus because Jesus is the word, was meant to bring forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. This is not other souls saved. It's the soul of the person who received the seed of the word out of heaven into their heart. We're here to come into the image of Jesus Christ. We behold in the mirror the glory of the Lord. We're transformed into that same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord to Spirit. Second Corinthians 3 and 18. This is what we're here. They're not teaching them that. They don't even tell them it's a possibility. They say, just be happy and contented that you're forgiven. Are you forgiven if you don't repent and believe? No. But they don't preach repent and believe. They teach accept. Just accept Jesus. But Jesus doesn't accept you unless you repent and believe. So if you repent, that which means change your mind, and you believe what he says about the gospel, you will know that you are to be coming into the image of Jesus Christ. Oh, how awesome. Verse 15. I am the Lord your Holy One the creator of Israel, your king. Thus saith the Lord, who maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. So even though the church is coming out of Babylon in this text, not Egypt, there is a Red Sea for the captors. He's, so he's applying the Red Sea to what's going to happen to these people who have kept God's people in bondage. Oh, hallelujah. Who bringeth forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man, they lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as a wick. Well, there you go, deep state. There you go, faction against the people of God in the church. There you go. This is where you're going. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Well, because they were in captivity, slaves to their old man over there, you know. So forget the persecution complex, because the blessing of God is coming now. You know, people find it hard to turn loose of their persecution complex. And go back to believing for the blessings and believing for the promises. They're just wondering when the shoe, next shoe is going to fall, right? Well, give it up. Give it up. Repent and believe, right? Behold, I will do a new thing. Now shall it spring forth. Shall you know it? Well, I hope so. I will even make a way in the wilderness. Now, we know what the wilderness is. Revelation 12 and Revelation 17 tells us it's the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years of the tribulation. It calls it the wilderness. So you see, the people of God are going into the tribulation. And most of them don't know that. They've been lied to by people that they should never have trusted. They should have read the Bible for themselves. But they're going into the wilderness to come to know the God who is the great and mighty God, the provider of everything. Amen. And rivers in the desert. Well, who could be sustained out there in the desert? Well, the one who controls the rivers could take care of them, couldn't he? Water out of the rock, right? So provision from Father out of heaven in the wilderness tribulation is going to sustain them. We, we have to believe. See, the problem was when they went out there, they, they listened to the naysayers. 
and they didn't believe, and some of them died in the wilderness, didn't they? Yeah. So we don't want that. But their fruit went into the promised land, right? Their children, their fruit. Now we're talking about a fruit here coming out of Babylonish bondage to be under the bride who is under the man-child. Hallelujah. Like David was above the leadership of God's people in Zion. And that Zion was called the bride. And that Zion was over the rest of God's people. So, verse 20 says, The beasts of the field shall honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Yeah, these are the kind of things that inhabited Babylon. Right? The Babylonish system. They took it over. That's where most of the demons are. They're not on the outside, they're on the inside. <laughs> to give drink to my people, my chosen. In other words, these people are going to see there's a real Savior, a real God who provides and loves his people. They've never experienced that. The people which I formed for myself, that they might set forth my praise. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. So, Gainol said, uh, after receiving this verse, I felt this dream concerned household salvation for my family and also the families of others. Well, yes, and uh, many of these and others will be coming out from under Babylonish Christianity and into the true kingdom because, but they're coming as babes, right? That's right. Because you can't grow up in Babylon. You just can't do it. You, they're coming as babies, right? And into the true kingdom because of our prayers of faith for them. Hold fast to your faith. And, you know, you've seen them in this depraved state. Uh, you may be one listening that's in this depraved state. You won't know the truth unless you just throw it all out the window and go start reading your New Testament. <laughs> yeah, that's what the church is supposed to look like. What you've been in is something else. And the devil don't mind giving us a fake church as long as we don't ever learn the truth and become a threat to his kingdom. So this is an awesome chapter, says Gaynold, of deliverance and redemption. Yes, the whole chapter is. And he alone is our Savior who has already met all of our needs. Amen. She says, praise the Lord for his faithfulness. I agree 100%. She says, I asked for a verse concerning the recliner and the footrest. That's very interesting. She said, I was given Romans 8 and 28. With my finger on, all things work together for good. See, if you've been in captivity for long enough, you don't know that God really wants to be good to you. You got that persecution complex, right? But God wants us to rest in all those good promises that you thought passed away. <laughs> rest in them. Believe in them, right? So she gave it in context, 26 through 30. So here we go, Romans 8, 26. And in like manner, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. Boy, I tell you, we are infirm when we come to the Lord. And we're infirm if we're in Babylon. You, don't, you need to get out of there. Come out from among them, my people. So it is the Spirit of God speaking through us that brings us into the rest from our own works. People are struggling. They want to obey God, but they don't know that the power of the gospel gives them the power and authority to do this. So they need to let the Spirit reveal the Word of God to them. And Isaiah 28, 11 says, Nay, but by men of strange lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Remember back on the day of Pentecost? Well, that never passed away. If you haven't gotten it yet, you're missing out on the rest. By men of strange lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, This is the rest. 
Give ye rest to him that is weary, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Well, they won't hear today either. They even say tongues is of the devil when the Bible says the exact opposite. It's of the Holy Spirit. So they won't go in, and they won't let you go in. They stand in the door. You need to depart quickly. You're wasting your life. You have a certain amount of time to bear that fruit, 36 and 100 fold, and they're wasting it for you. And continuing with Gay Knowles' text there, uh, Romans 8, 26. For we know not how we should pray as we ought. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us in groanings that cannot be uttered. You need the Holy Spirit to pray through you for your circumstances and situation. That's what tongues is for. That's what the Holy Spirit, the first manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life is going to be. And it's the most important because he gave it to everybody back then. More than any other gift. Right. So at the beginning of the wilderness tribulation, the Spirit's going to be poured out because when they went through their Red Sea, the first thing they had there was the wilderness, which is called the tribulation. And that's where they were baptized in the sea and in the cloud, which is the Holy Spirit and the Shekinah glory, right? So she says, the baby in the Spirit of the Lord's hands we must rest in him and, and his ability to change hearts. Yes, resting from your works and your attempts to be godly, but trusting in his power to put you there, and that's how he does it. Verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You know why a lot of your prayers aren't heard? You're not asking according to the will. Who does? The Spirit of God. He has the mind of Christ. And he prays correctly. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And he will give that gift to you. I was in a, my first, the first church I really stayed in for very long. Had 300 people. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and spoke in tongues. Because they thought it was important. So don't say he won't give it to you. That's a lying devil. Okay. 28. And we know that to them that love God, all things work together for good, even to them that are called according to his purpose. Everything is going to work for your good. And I think um, she was speaking about how this is um, a reference to the baby. This next text here, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son. There's the baby. The baby represents a body of people who have, are coming into the image of the son. Right? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, oh goodness, look here. They're all supposed to do this too. <laughs> and, and whom... He foreordained, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Notice, whoever starts out at the beginning of that verse ends up at the end of that verse. Whom he foreordained, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. So if you're not foreordained, you can play religion all day long, but you're not going to end up there. Okay. So it's faith in the promises that keeps us in the rest. You don't want to like that baby, fall off the rest. You're in trouble if you do that. You hit the ground. That hurts. So it keeps us in the rest because as we see in our text, the Father has already prophetically delivered us and provided for us. So why worry? Rest in his promises, right? Amen. Well, redemption from the curse on Father's people for their sin is truly finished. In fact, God's works were finished from the foundation of the world, Hebrews 4 and 3. When he spoke the plan into existence, 
The only thing left is for the true sons of God to enter into those works by faith, believing they have received, as Jesus said. He said, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you have received them, and you shall have them. Since the works were finished, we should believe and rest from our own works to save, heal, deliver ourselves, etc. For we who have believed do enter into that rest. Well, notice, it's not the one who ceases on Saturday or on Sunday, but the one who believes who enters into the new covenant Sabbath rest. That's right. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest. The Greek word here is sabbatismos, the keeping of rest, a continual rest. Right. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So notice, you're supposed to rest from your works every day, not just one day a week. You'll go to hell if you just rest one day a week. you got to cease from your works. If you walk after the flesh, you must die. All right. So this constant keeping of rest every day, not one day a week, through the past tense promises of our spiritual Sabbath. Verse 10 says, For he that hath he that is entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works. That's that's bad works. <laughs> and even religious works. That's bad works too. Okay. It rested from his works as God did from his. So this rest is to believe these past tense promises and rest from our own works in order to see God's power save us. He, he said, His power is made perfect in weakness, our weakness, right? So our faith in each of these promises brings us into more of the rest. We should be diligent not to leave out even one of these promises for our own good, right? Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 says, Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. So, so don't disbelieve the promises and the commands of God. For indeed, we have had good tidings preached unto us, even as also they, but the word of hearing did not profit them because it was not united by faith with them that heard. So if you don't believe the promise, you're going nowhere with God. You're never going to grow. You'll, and even if you are a baby Christian, like this revelation starts out as, you'll stay there. They did. They're coming out of the Babylonish churches. And guess what? They're still babies. They were ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You have to go get the truth for yourself and read it. So this is true faith and always brings the answer. Through believing the promises, we enter in to rest from our own works. For a child of God to say that they believe that they've received and yet continue seeking to receive usually through worldly methods, is to be double-minded. James 1, 6 and 7 says, and 8, by the way, says, Let him ask in faith, nothing doubting, for he that doubteth is like the surge of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I remember a friend of mine telling me, that the Lord told him he had healed his wife, and he was mad because she died. But the Lord did say that in his word that he healed his wife. I tried to tell this man that. He was mad at God, turned away from God, fell off into the world because God had told him he had healed his wife. But he did it at the cross. But if you don't mix faith with the promise, it won't come to pass. Whose fault is that? 
those who continue to work for what God has freely given believe in salvation by works. They wouldn't say that, but they do. Hebrews 4 and 10, He that is entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works. And we see that they were not able to enter in because of unbelief. That's apithia. It also means disobedience. Because if you're disobedient, you will not be believing, right? If you're believing, you will be obedient because that's where obedience comes from. You see, that's why the same word is there. So, we have to rest from our works. If we don't do that, we're going to lose out. We're not going to bear fruit. You can't bear the fruit of the word if you don't believe the word. Right? So since the promises of deliverance from the curse are past tense, by whose stripes you were healed, who delivered us out of the power of darkness, past tense, you know, uh, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, right? They're all past tense. So when we believe them, we must stop working. It's an evil heart of unbelief to not rest and just believe God. You said it's done, God. I believe you. I don't have a problem with sin. I've got a problem with faith. I repent. <laughs> yeah. God was angry with Israel because they would not believe his word in their trial in the wilderness. Like Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 3, 8 through 10 is pretty well there. Let's look at Hebrews 3, 11 through 14. It says, As I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Well, now, this is not a snooze we're talking about. This is, this is a, if you don't enter into this rest, you do not bear fruit and you do not enter into the kingdom. As I swear in my wrath, you say, well, the church isn't appointed under wrath. Oh, you're wrong. If they don't believe, they just come under the same wrath as the rest of the world, the rest of the unbelievers. As I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. Take heed, brethren lest happily there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away. Uh-oh, that's what the baby was doing. Good thing somebody caught that baby, huh? <laughs> in falling away from the living God. Yes. And I'm going to jump on down to 14. We are become partakers of Christ that is, his health, his holiness, his blessings, deliverance from sin. If, uh-oh, gosh, I thought it was unconditional. We are become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end. Oh, my. And when we believe we have received, as Jesus said to do, in everything that you pray. All things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you have received. That's what the original text says. That's what the received text even has a note in it that says that. But they translated it wrong. We have received. We received it at the cross. When we believe we have received, we are put in a position of weakness because we can't do anything to bring the desired result to pass. Or we proved that we didn't believe we received it. So this weakness is rest in our wilderness experiences because there's no help from Egypt or from the world or from your flesh, which represents the same thing. Only God's power saves in the wilderness. Did you notice? There weren't boxcars coming out of Egypt, was there? No. 
God says, my power is made perfect in weakness. Second Corinthians 12 and 9. You got a big problem, big sickness, big sin, big demons, whatever. Do you know that you don't have to be strong? You just have to believe and speak the word of God. My power is made perfect in weakness. Are you trying to go to a psychiatrist? To get, they don't know what to do. Do you know who goes to psychiatrists more than any other profession? Psychiatrists do because they're dealing with demons and they don't know it. They're the most messed up profession and they don't fix anybody. They just dope you into senility. What about the doctors? Let's see, I think it's up to about 425 to 450 thousand people a year die of iatropic, that is doctor-related, causes. Hmm, I thought they're supposed to be healers. No, they stole that from the healer. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and, and deliverance from demons is alive and well, saints. You're struggling with um, an overwhelming power against you. In many cases, that's involved. If you don't know how to do it, go to somebody that does. Okay? You, you've been delivered out of the power of darkness. They have no authority over you. You are free. You were made free from sin. Romans chapter 6. You were made free from sin. Do you believe it? That's how you get it. If we refuse to be weak, God refuses to be strong. To the extent you refuse to be weak, to that extent God refuses to be strong. Our weapon against our enemies who try to talk us out of our covenant rights is the two-edged sword of these past tense promises. We just read them. God's already accomplished this rest for you. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Go find out every promise that has to do with your problem and believe you've received it. Okay. Uh, because God's people haven't been told the truth, they're like a baby sitting on a, a, rec a recliner footrest. Their feet need to be rested. From their works, they're running here and running there because they don't know it's already done. They just keep running and running and running, trying to find a way out. God already made the way out. It's, it's uh, believing and speaking the word of God. Ain't that great? It's free. If it isn't free, it ain't God. Do you understand that? Grace is free. If they're charging you for it, <clears throat> that's not his method. So, <laughs> Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask, Lord, that the brethren are ready to, those that are spiritual, ready to receive these babies or know what to do when their little kingdom crumbles around them and their preacher runs off in the distance. He's no help at all because he's, he's one of them they're after, right? So, Lord, we just ask you in Jesus' name, Lord, have mercy upon your people. Pour out your spirit upon your people. Let us be empowered to walk in the totalness of your rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, please bless Michael and the brethren that are coming to join him in the study. We ask your blessings upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good night, saints. God bless you. Bye. Well, thank you, Brother David, and God bless you. Hello, saints. Good to be back with you again. Got a nice sunny day out there. It might be a little clouds, but that's okay. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the faith that you've placed in all of us to believe that we can walk this holy and sinless life that you've placed here in your word for us to do, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you put a hunger in our hearts to study the Word of God more and get all of these great promises in our heart, Lord. And I praise you for it. Father, be with us today as we get out this message on Saved by Faith. 
And Lord, let it be a blessing to everybody in Jesus' name. Well, that's what I want to talk about. Being saved by faith. You know, it's real important that we study the Word of God because the Word of God is that seed that brings forth Christ. And the Word of God renews our mind so that we can walk with the Spirit. Romans 12 and 2 says, And be not fashioned according to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Folks, the natural carnal mind can't walk with the Spirit. Amos 3 and 3 says, Shall two walk together except they have agreed? The Spirit is foolishness to the carnal mind. 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, For the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. So when we come into agreement with God, then we can walk in the Spirit. Our capacity to walk hand in hand with Jesus as he walked, our capacity to walk in the Spirit is directly related to how much of that word we're agreeing with. That's because if you're not agreeing with the Word, and if you ain't agreeing with God, you ain't going to listen to Him, and you're not going to obey Him. And when these principles of the Word are involved in a situation or circumstance that you're in, you're not going to be obedient to Him because you're disagreeing with Him. How do you come to recognize, how do we come to know the voice of the Spirit? We become familiar with His Word. And that's why we've been given this word. We were given the New Testament in order to renew our mind so that we can walk in the Spirit. And living according to the New Testament is to walk in the Spirit. It's to walk with Christ and abide in Him. The New Testament gives us that familiarity with the word so that we can walk with him. How do you know what voice speaks to you unless you're familiar with the person of that voice through their own words, through their own nature, through their own character? Because when you study the word, you begin to know the voice of the spirit and you can see where the people go astray of him. And the more familiar you become with the word, the quicker that you can see the error where people miss it or where they go astray from the word. Folks, we need to have fellowship with God through the word so that we can be led by the spirit to God and be called sons of God. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8 and 15, he says, For ye received not the spirit of bondage again unto fear. Those people under the old covenant didn't have the Holy Spirit, and they were in bondage to the law. John chapter 7, verse 39 says this, said, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they kept the law, they had to do it by their own strength and by their own ability. But that wasn't possible. James chapter 2 and verse 10 says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's become guilty of all. And if we're trying to keep the law of the Old Testament, then we have made ourselves a bond servant. You know that. And the bond servant abideth not in the house forever. The son abideth forever. Folks, the Holy Spirit's job is to bring us into that adoption. Romans 8 and 15. For ye received not the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of adoption because his job, his job is to manifest Christ in us. Jesus said in John 16 and 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you. Our faith is what makes it possible for the Holy Spirit to manifest Jesus in us. 
You must be calling those things that are not as though they were. You have to do that. You must accept sonship now if it's ever going to be manifested. The Holy Spirit, folks, moves through our faith, and he brings things to pass because of our faith. He ain't got nothing to do if you don't have faith. There's no promises for you in this word if you don't have faith. 1 John 5 and 4, For whatsoever is begotten of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that hath overcome the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. The Holy Spirit is to bring us to the adoption of sonship, and the adoption is the end of our faith, not the beginning of our faith. 1 Peter 1 and 9, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. God manifests the adoption because of the salvation of the soul, which is when the soul bears fruit 30, 60, or 100 fold. We're sons of God by faith, folks. We're adopted by faith. Paul definitely teaches that we are adopted sons of God by faith. And folks, that's a marvelous thing that God reckons our faith is righteousness. Because that means a baby Christian that's just now coming into the kingdom, he can enter into, into that kingdom by his faith. Otherwise, ain't nobody who has yet manifested sonship would have any hope or have any chance if it wasn't by faith. James 2 and 17 says, Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead in itself. Faith has to be walked in. In verse 18, and by my works will show thee my faith. Folks, there are, there are a lot of folks out there who say they have faith, but it's not real faith because they're not walking in it. They only acknowledge in their mind that they have faith. You can't stand still in faith. Real faith moves, folks. Real faith has action. Without action, faith is dead or it's incomplete. Romans 8 and 16 says, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It don't say sons there, does it? That's because Paul is talking here about manifestation. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says, Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. Folks, we have to be careful in rightly dividing the word of truth, as it says in 2 Timothy 2 and 15. And since he's talking about manifestation, then we can say that all those who are walking by faith are at least children of God by manifestation. 1 John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, now are we children of God, not sons of God, and it is not yet made manifest what we shall be. You, how many of you know that what we shall be is Christ? 1 Corinthians 13 and 12. For now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully, even as also I was fully known. Folks, we're going to see him face to face. We're going to look at him through our mirror. God's purpose in Christ is to bring about his life in us so that manifestly we're sons of God. 1 John 3 and 2, Beloved, now are we children of God, and it is not yet made manifest what we shall be. We know that if he shall be manifested, we shall be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. Romans 8 and 16, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if, now we're children, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, only if we also suffer with him. And let's go on. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. Suffering is what happens when you're led by the Spirit because your flesh always wants to go the opposite way. First Peter 4 and 1. For as much then as Christ suffered in the flesh, arm ye 
yourselves also with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Why is that? It's because when you suffer in the flesh, it means that you're going against the flesh and you're walking in the spirit. You have to suffer with Christ in order to be glorified with Christ. And in order for the spirit to grow in you, you have to suffer the death of self, the death of the old man. Walking in the spirit is suffering the death of self. Romans 8 and 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to usward. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The Greek word for revealing, there comes from the, from uh, that word apokalypto, and it mean and it means unveiling. Creation is waiting for the unveiling or manifestation of the sons of God. The sons of God are hidden to the world. And the reason they're hidden to the world is that they're not yet acting in agreement with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we know that the full adoption doesn't happen until we receive our new body. And it says that a little bit further down in the scriptures. But we also know that the manifestation of sonship in Christ was true in spirit and soul before he received a new body. Jesus did his works in this earth as, ma as a manifested son in spirit and in soul before he received his new body. Creation is waiting for the manifestation of sons of God in spirit and in soul, even while they are walking in their body of flesh. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10 and 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And that's the truth. The creation needs the manifestation of Son so that the creation itself will be delivered. Romans 8 and 20, For the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. We have the authority in Christ to bring deliverance to creation. Just think how it'd be if God's children came to understand that the inheritance has been given to us. We've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. What's the power of the enemy? That's the curse. But we have been given that authority over the curse. Acts 10.38 says, Even Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, the works of corruption. And since the creation is under the bondage of corruption because of the fall of man, now God's reversing that process. And this time, God is going to save man and use man to bring about the deliverance of the creation. So the creation is waiting for that man to be saved manifestly. And all of creation is waiting for man to come into what God has provided. Creation never would have been delivered into corruption had it, be, had it not been for man. And now what God doing? He's reversing the process through the spiritual man, Jesus Christ. And that's in us. Romans 8 and 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only so, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even as even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for our adoption to wit the redemption of our body. This redemption of the body that Paul's talking about here is a new body, because Christ is to be manifested in us. First the spirit, then soul, and then the body. That fullness of adoption happens when you get the new body. He's talking about the new creation of Christ. We don't have anything to do with the new body right now, but we can deliver our body of flesh from the bondage of corruption. 
This body that we walk in is part of the natural creation. So we have authority to deliver this body from corruption while we walk in Jesus Christ. And of course, we have no authority to deliver this body while we walk in willful sin. Hebrews uh, 10, 26 through 27 tells us that. And then verse 24 in Romans 8 says this, For in hope were we saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for that which he sees? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Folks, we're patiently waiting for the full manifestation which we received by faith and which we received in hope. You know what hope is, don't you? Hope is a firm expectation. We're expecting to see it, but most of the church don't expect ever to see that. They're real content to just accept what little they got right now. But that ain't God's plan. It ain't his. It's not even his, his part of his purpose. His purpose is to manifest sons, and the manifestation of sonship is going to deliver all of creation from this bondage of corruption. And that creation is groaning under all of that. We're sons of, of God through faith right now. At this point, we have manifested sonship in our spirit, and we are manifesting sonship in our soul, and we will have manifested sonship in our body at the adoption. So what we're saying about sonship is exactly the same thing we're saying about salvation. Sonship in your spirit is instantaneous, but then sonship in your soul is a progressive walk. Manifestly, we are children of servant or servant, but we want to grow up to be sons, don't we? There's a, a, an important difference between servants and sons and between children and sons. A child doesn't have the same capacity to serve as does a full-grown son. But a servant may serve for reasons other than a son serves. If you're a hired servant, you serve for gain, don't you? And if you're a bond servant, you serve because you have to. A true son doesn't serve for either one of those reasons because a true son serves for love. So a son serves his father for one reason while servants serve for other reasons. You see, God wants a different relationship with us. The relationship we had when we started with him is not the one he plans for us. We came to him as carnal children, and we're somewhere between there and where we're supposed to be. But God takes us from where we are, and he wants to bring us to where he is. And that's what people need to realize. We're here to manifest sonship, folks. We're here for a purpose. We're here to run a race. We're here to bear the fruit of Jesus Christ, 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's what we're here for. And people who miss that point ain't never going to bear fruit. And they're going to remain that unprofitable servant throughout their whole walk. And if you remember, the Galatian church was rebuked by, by Paul because they allowed the Jews to drag them back under the law. Back from being sons to being servants. And even though the Galatians started out by faith in Jesus Christ, they went back under the law. He said to him in Galatians 3 and 3, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now perfected in the flesh? Did ye suffer so many things in vain, if it in, be indeed in vain? He therefore that supplies to you the Spirit, and works miracles among you, Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, what God does for us, he does it because of our faith, not because of the works of the law. Everything that God does from here until the end, he's doing because of our faith. What is faith? Faith is when you call the things that are not as though they were. In other words, you are believing, present tense, that you have received, past tense, something simply on the grounds that God says you got it. And not on the grounds that you see it or that you hear it or that you feel it. You are believing strictly 
on the grounds that the Bible says he has given it to you, and therefore it's yours. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe that ye received them, and ye shall have them. And that answer is going to be manifested. But first you have to believe you have received. And you've got to accept it by faith, and then it's going to be manifest. That's the gospel, folks. And it's free. And from the most ignorant baby Christian on up, you can receive God's blessing because you receive through your faith and not according to your ability. Paul tells us in Galatians 3 and 26, For ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And what he's trying to do here is to convince the Galatians of this because the Galatians came out from under sonship. They went from being sons of God to being servants of God when they put themselves back under the law. Galatians 5 and 4 says, You are severed from Christ. And if you're severed from Christ, then you're severed from sonship because he is sonship. His life in you is sonship. Verse 4 again, ye are severed from Christ, ye who would be justified or made righteous by the law. Ye are fallen away from grace. Verse 5, for we through the spirit of faith, by faith, wait for the hope of righteousness. What is righteousness? That's Jesus Christ. And how sad it is that so many Christians don't understand what righteousness is. And how sad it is that they are so willing to settle just for being forgiven. How long can you stay in that position and not walk in the Spirit? Not long, because you'll be an unprofitable servant. Folks, we're running a race against the time that God has given us here, and we have to bear fruit within that time. And if you stay an unprofitable servant for very long, you're not going to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. That's the reason you're here in the first place. Jesus said that the ones who will make it will bear fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold, Matthew 13 and 3. And he spake to them many things in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went forth to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and birds came and devoured them. And others fell upon the rocky places, where they had not much earth, and straightway they sprang up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell upon the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And others fell upon the good ground and yielded fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He that hath ears, let him hear. Hear then ye the, verse 18, hear then ye the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the evil one and snatches away that which hath been sown in his heart. This is he that was sown by the wayside, and he that was sown upon the rocky places. This is he that hears the word, and straightway with joy receives it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, straightway he stumbles. And he that was sown among the thorns, this is he that hears the word, and the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. And he that was sown upon the good ground, this is he that hears the word and understands it, who verily bears fruit, brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So the other three out of the four people he mentioned there didn't make it. And that should encourage us to go forward and to use the time that we have, folks. Colossians 4 and 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. The Bible says to redeem the time, and we have to do that. There ain't nothing else more important in this world, and nothing else is important in this world. We have been put here, sown as a seed in the thirst, which is his body, in order to bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And if we get a good ground of that seed sown, we're going to manifest Christ. Praise God. All right, let's back up to what Paul told the Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 26. For ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. 
Now, how does that line up with what he said in Romans? Romans 13 and 12, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So we see here that putting on Christ is putting on righteousness. And Paul tells you to do that. However, here he also says that if you have been baptized into Christ, you did put on Christ. In other words, by faith, when you were baptized, your old man died, and now Christ lives in you. You put him on by faith. But James chapter 2 and verse 17 says this, Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead in itself. Now, a person who walks on past their baptism should be walking in death to self. And through Ephesians 5 and 26, the washing of water with the word, because that's what baptism is. It's the water of baptism that puts to death that old man. And gives life to that new man. The water of baptism represents the same water as the word. After baptism, the word manifests baptism. The word puts to death that old man and gives life to the new man. The word causes you to put on Christ. Baptism is an act of faith that says, I have received it all. It's mine. That old man is dead and the new man lives and that new man is Jesus. I am now a son of God. That's what you profess at baptism. And that's what you believe at baptism. You put on Christ when you're baptized. Galatians 4 and 1 says, <clears throat> But I say that so long as the heir is a child, he differs nothing from a bondservant. There it is right there. A child is a servant. Proverbs says the same thing in 29 and 21. He that delicately brings up his servant from a child shall have him become a son at the last. Then Galatians 4 and 1, it says again, But I say that so long as the heir is a child, he differs nothing from a bondservant, though he is Lord of all. <clears throat> so, as long as the heir is still a child, he lives like a bondservant, even though he's Lord of all. And we know that the Galatians had fallen back to being children. Because Paul goes on and says in verse 19, My little children, of whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you. You see, the problem was that they were severed from Christ because of their seeking to be justified by the law. The Bible says that if you go back under the law, you're cut off from Christ. Christ being formed in you is a matter of accepting it by faith from the very beginning at the time of your baptism and then continuing to walk in that faith. The Bible says we stand in Christ by faith, otherwise we're going to be broken off. By their unbelief, the Galatians were broken off after they were children of God. Romans 11 and 19. Thou wouldst say then, branches were broken off that I might be glor that I might be grafted in. Well, by their unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by thy faith. Be not high minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, neither will he spare thee. Behold then the goodness and severity of God toward them that fell, severity, but toward thee God's goodness, if Thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. <clears throat> and they also, if they continue not in their own belief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. The Galatians had gotten out from under faith. There ain't no justification in the New Testament for the law. And if you're seeking to be justified or accepted by God through the law, you're cut off from Christ, and there ain't no hope. Paul was telling those Galatians, don't listen to these Jews. If you think that you're going to be justified by keeping days and seasons and months and all the law, then you're cut off from Christ. Your children again, your servants again. It's not just the law of the Old Testament that cuts people off from Christ, folks. It can be the laws that your church makes up, or it can be the laws that you might make up of yourself. 
Anything that causes you to follow another spirit instead of the spirit of Christ separates you from Christ. Folks, we're put here to follow the spirit of Christ. Rules and regulations that are not scriptural rules and regulations causes you to go down a legalistic road. And that prevents you from being able to hear the voice of the spirit. A good example to look at from the Old, uh, Old Testament law is that one of tithing. And if you listen to the voice of the Spirit, he's going to make a good giver out of you. But he's going to have you to give to things that you might not ordinarily give to. And the percentage, most of the time, is going to be greater because you're following the Spirit. God's always going to return what you sow. Luke 6 and 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall they give unto your bosom. For with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And God promises us in 2 Corinthians 9 and 6, He that sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So we have in this example right here, the law separates you from Christ because the law says one thing about your money, but the Spirit of God tells you something else in the New Testament. The Old Testament law tells you to bring your tithe into the storehouse, which was in the middle of the temple. <clears throat> and the Spirit tells you that now the storehouse is the people of God because the people of God are His temple. And Paul goes on to tell us another way that we can be separated from Christ. Galatians 4 and 3 says, So we also, when we were children, were held in bondage under the rudiments. That's the Greek word stokion, and it means principles. <sighs> rudiments of the world. If you follow the principles of the world, you can't follow Christ. Because the principle of the world makes you a child. It makes you a servant. And the Galatians were following the principles of the world. There's a whole lot of ways you can follow the principles of the world, folks. One common way is to profess God and country. But what does it say in the Bible? It ain't God and country. It's not God and anything else. It's God, period. God might lead you to obey the rulers of this land, but your allegiance is not to America, don't you know? Because your allegiance is to God. And you certainly ought not to pledge allegiance to America. You ought not to pledge to anything in the first place. Matthew 5.33 says, Again, you shall have heard that it was said to them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by the heaven, for it is the throne of God nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, for thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your speech be, yea, yea, nay, nay. And whatsoever is more than these is of the evil one. Folks, our allegiance is to God and him alone. The rudiments of the world, the principles of the world, they separate you from Christ. Unless you understand that, we're not to war the way the world wars. You, you, you may go to war for men and for the kingdom of the devil and not realize that you're working for them. Here's what Jesus told us in verse 39 of Matthew 5. But I say unto you, resist not him that is evil, but whosoever smites thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Folks, Christians walk a different path than the world does. And one reason that we walk so contrary to the world is that the world was created to crucify us. They were created to come against us, and they have a different spirit than ours. We can't put ourselves on the cross, but the world can. And if you deny yourself by resisting not him that is evil as Jesus told you to do. The world will put you on the cross and you're out, that old man's going to die. But the spirit of patriotism is just one of many principles of the world that's going to separate you from following the spirit. And if you, we keep on reading here in Galatians, we'll find yet another principle of the world 
that Paul says is going to cut us off from the Spirit. Galatians 4, 9. But now that ye have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how turn ye back again to the weak and beggarly rudiments, whereunto ye desire to be in bondage over again? Ye observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid of you, lest by any means I have bestowed labor upon you in vain. So the revival that the Galatians had of coming into Christ could have been for nothing because they were going back into bondage to these principles of the law. They had turned from following the Spirit, turned from accepting God's righteousness through faith, turned from accepting sonship through faith. And if we're in bondage to anything, we're not free to follow the Lord. Folks, it can be bondage to the law, it can be bondage to self, it can be bondage to the principles of the world. God gave us his word to transform our minds, to renew our minds so that we could walk in freedom as Christ walked in freedom. He gave us his word so that we can do the will of the Father. John 8 and 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, it says. Our faith in the truth will cause us to walk in freedom, but the Galatians didn't have Christ formed in them anymore. It was gone. And it's not possible to have Christ formed in you when you're not walking in faith. And anybody who's not walking by the faith in the Spirit, they're in danger of not having Christ formed in them. Folks, this is warfare. The devil is out to deceive us. He wants to get us off of the road of grace and truth and hung up into bondages such as legalism or bondage to self. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, <clears throat> But I buffet my body and bring it into bondage, lest by any means after that I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. So if you're serving your body, you're not serving Christ. And if you're not serving Christ, then he's not your Lord. That's real simple right there. We are here to increasingly make Christ Lord in every area of our life. And that's what it is to bear fruit and manifest sonship. If these Galatians had not been corrected, they never would have manifested sonship and would have been unprofitable servants because they no longer were walking by faith in the Spirit. And now just remember that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of adoption and His job is, is to bring us to that adop that adoption. And we have that adoption by faith. And we'll have it by manifestation if we walk by faith. Paul prayed in uh, Ephesians 3 and 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, <clears throat> from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, that you may be strengthened with power, through his spirit in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And the purpose of his prayer was that they would be strengthened by the spirit so that Christ could dwell in their hearts through faith. And the only way Christ can dwell in your heart is through faith. The only way he can manifest there is through faith. The spirit strengthens you because of your faith to bring forth Christ in your heart. It ain't going to be because you work up the willpower because of your ignorance, but it's going to be because of your faith. The Holy Spirit will empower you to walk as Christ walked because of your faith, which Romans 4 and 17 says, cause the things that are not as though they were. And in Ephesians 3 and 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith to the end or to the manifestation, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be strong, to apprehend. That Greek word there for apprehend is katalambano, and it means to take eagerly, to seize, to possess. So we see here that the end result is not that you just comprehend, but that you grasp it. It has to be yours. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith to the end that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled unto all the fullness of God. 
He says that you can apprehend all of what Christ is. He says you can apprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ. That, folks, is a great promise for us. How many of you was ever offered that hope of the gospel when you were back in religion? The preachers were constantly telling us the opposite of the gospel. I've had them say, you're always going to be in bondage to sin, so just accept your forgiveness by faith. Well, if you do that, you ain't never going to bear fruit, praise God. Accepting your forgiveness is a means to an end, and the end is the manifestation of Christ in you. And if you stop with forgiveness, you lost it all. But many people, they're real content to stop with forgiveness, even though it's not the gospel. That ain't the good news. Let me tell you something. If forgiveness was all we needed, we wouldn't have ever needed the New Testament because they received forgiveness through the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament. But the blood of good bulls and goats didn't take away sin. It couldn't destroy the nature of sin. It didn't have that power. The New Testament has come to take away sin and to replace it with Christ, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Christ. The New Testament has come to destroy all the nature of sin and replace it with all of Christ and with all of his love. And if that ain't your goal, if you can't see this goal by faith, then you can't have it. Faith has to see something before it can grasp it, before it can be manifested. So you have to believe that this is possible. And that's why Jesus died for us. He died in order that you could have Christ, in order that you could have the reconciliation, the exchange. And that ought to motivate all of us to go on and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled unto all the fullness of God. And to be full of God is the end result and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit makes it possible, folks. There's a bunch of Pentecostals who mistakenly believe that the end result is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That ain't true. The Holy Spirit was given to us so that we can receive power. Paul said that ye may be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inward man. That's the power to bring to pass the fullness of God in you. So you're not saved just because you got the Spirit of God. And some, uh, well, I should say a lot of people are confused about that. You're not saved because you have the Holy Spirit. You're saved because you follow the you follow you follow you follow the Holy Spirit. Romans eight and fourteen says, "For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God." Now, an unprofitable servant might have the Holy Spirit, but they ain't going to walk in him. They will not obey him. A person who walks in faith will be motivated to obey the Holy Spirit. And the more you read the Word, the more the Word motivates you to obey him. The true Word motivates you to be more like Christ. The true Word always motivates you to exercise faith so that the Holy Spirit can empower you to be more like Christ. But the word of the false prophets always causes you to rest in the flesh. And according to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is bound until you loosen to live through you by your faith. Matthew 18 and 18, Verily I say unto you, What things soever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And what things soever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He meant it, folks. Jesus meant it for the good. And he did mean it for the evil also. It's true both ways. And <clears throat> excuse me. And that's why it's so important that we become empowered because of our faith. And Paul said the end result was unto all the fullness of God. God offers this promise, and at the end of this age the promise is going to be manifest because the word that Paul preached are going to be believed in that day. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10 says, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at in all them that believe, because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. To which end we also pray always for you, that our God may count you worthy of your calling, 
and fulfill every desire of goodness and every work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, there are going to be some people out there who are going to manifest this fullness of God, not because of the power of man, but it's because of the faith of God working through man and bringing forth the works of God. It's God's grace all the way. And in Ephesians 4 and 11, here's another example. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting in the Greek means to strengthen, to complete, to make one what he ought to be. That's sonship. That's the same thing we're talking about. Unto the work of ministering, unto the building up of the body of Christ, till we all attain unto the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a full-grown man, or a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Did y'all know that God was offering us that? You, you, you ain't going to get that from religion out there, but that's what the Bible says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that you can walk as he walked. And if you don't believe that, then you're not able to exercise faith in something that God offers to you. And if you remember, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3 and 8, He that does the sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. To this end was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament couldn't take away sin. But you know what? The blood of Christ takes it away. If you want to adjust the forgiveness of God, you needed to live during the time of the Old Testament because they had forgiveness, but they didn't have the blood of Christ, and that takes away the sin. Paul is talking there about the nature of sin that causes you to offend God. He's not talking about the offense against God. Jesus died to take away the nature of sin to give you the nature of God. John 1 and 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The nature of God, folks, can't be received outside of the Scripture because Christ was the Word made flesh. Amos 3 and 3, Shall two walk together except they have agreed? So we have to agree with the Scripture. How can you follow the voice of the Spirit if you don't know Him? The Scriptures were given so that you may personally know the Holy Spirit and so that you can follow His voice. Romans 8 and 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Being led by the Spirit ain't the same thing as being under the Old Testament law, which you had to follow. That was required. Ephesians 4 and 14, that we may be no longer children. So we're talking about going from children to sons here. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. And that's referring to all the lies of religious men out there. In craftiness after the wiles of error. But speaking truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. Folks, we're growing up into Christ, and sonship is growing up into him in all things as the head, or in other words, letting him be your Lord in all things. Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers are gone forth into the world. Just like it was back in Jesus' day, it's true in our day today too. Most of what we're calling Christianity are people who have been deceived into accepting less than what the Bible offers. Verse 7, For many deceivers are gone forth into the world, even they that confess not that Jesus Christ comes in the flesh. John here is talking about Christ coming in the natural body of our flesh in which we now live. Christ will be manifested in a corporate body of believers. 
And he does that progressively as you mature in Christ. The belief, the, uh, all the deceivers don't believe that. They don't believe that Christ in you, the hope of glory, is possible. The deceivers don't believe that Christ will be manifested in us. But we just got through reading. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And filled unto all the fullness of God. All the deceivers are not going to admit that. They're going to admit that Jesus came in the flesh, but not that he is coming in the flesh. Even though Jesus said, himself said that. He was coming uh, he was going to come as a baby that was born to a woman, John 16 and 19. Jesus perceived that they were desirous to ask him. And he said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves concerning this, that I said a, a little while, and you behold me not, and again a little while, and you shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, ye shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come. But when she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. And ye therefore now have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no one takes away from you. He said, you are in travail right now like a woman in travail when she's having a baby. But when the baby is born, you will rejoice because you will see me again. That's Christ is the fruit that's being born unto us. Y'all remember the parable of the sower? The Greek, therefore, the seed that was sown is sperma. And that's the word of God. Matthew 13 and 23. And he that was sown upon the good ground this is he that hears the word and understands it, who verily bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, sixty and third, and some thirty. A seed, folks, can only bring forth after its own kind. <clears throat> the seed which it has been sown in us is the word of God. And if you receive this word into your heart and into your thinking, it will bring forth the fruit of God who is Christ. Remember what Jesus said. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. How can we be the mother of Christ? Well, it's simple. The seed of God has been spiritually sown in the womb of your heart. And if you give fertile ground to that seed, it's going to bring forth Christ. When Mary's kinswoman, Elizabeth, prophesied to Mary in the Spirit of the Lord, she said, in Luke 1 and 45. And blessed is she that believed, for thou shalt be a fulfillment of the things which have been spoken to her from the Lord. What was that? Well, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Wherefore also the holy thing which is begotten shall be called the Son of God. And it was spoken that Christ would be born to her. But only the people who believe are empowered to have the fruit of Christ. Mary bore the fruit of Christ because she believed the word of God that was spoken to her. And that's the same way it is today, folks. Jesus said, for whosoever shall do the will of my father is my mother. Because if we believe the word of God that's been spoken to us, that word is going to bring forth fruit. And that fruit is Christ because the word is Christ. John chapter 1 and 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see here Christ was the word made flesh, and it's sown into our hearts by our studying the word of God. Well, folks, I'm out of time. God bless you. I hope this blesses you. And we'll see you next time, God willing. For information, materials, and to contribute, go to unleavenedbreadministries.org. Contributions only may be addressed to David Eels, Post Office Box 231616, Montgomery, Alabama, 36123.
thirsting soul, pure as water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus.